with everything that's going on, it's like, this shit ain't that serious. Nobody's stuff really is. We get caught up in so much, like, little stuff day in, day out. It's like, just trying, I just want everyone to, like, have a good time. Everywhere I go, I just want people to have fun and, like, smile and do all that. So I just, I try not to take stuff too seriously. I hope it translates to my work to an extent without getting, like, too, like I said, you know, kind of loosey-goosey. But more or less, I just think at the end of the day, when you're all said and done, you're retired, you're dead, whatever, you're not going to be like, damn, I wish I was just a little more uptight, you know, in my whole life. It's yeah. like, people just get so wound and I'm guilty of it too, but I try not to. Pass the torch, man. Keeps getting better. You guys have a you guys have a pretty good live setup in subpar and stuff. Yeah, we have right? a studio. It's night. Like we literally come in, like check, check. Like, all right, you're good. You check, check. All right. We're live. Yeah, we get. We don't do. Dude, I don't know how to upload. I don't know how to get it on iTunes. I don't know how to fucking edit. I don't know how to do shit. Yeah, we get scrappy. I did this little one series where I was like, when I was like, before any of this shit started, I was like, gonna try to sell my shit, like, get going in it because I wanted to do it. So I did like seven on my own and it was so ratchet. Like, the way I set it up, I had like one mic. I both had mics, but like, only one mic was working. And then, so like, the I do this cool interview. I had some good dudes, like, some golfers and non golfers and shit um like jeff ogilvy and i can't remember who else uh, like kirk herb street and stuff like that and they were like good fucking but the audio was so shit and then like in the middle of that i was gonna take like 10 of them and try to just package it and release it and just see how it went yeah and uh but like the audio was so bad and i didn't know how to edit and i was having to get people to help me and i was just like fuck and then all of a sudden like other stuff happened i was like thank god so you were hustling on your own for a little bit for a yeah while. i was trying to like put a little package together I kept talking about it and they're like, well, what's stopping you? Just do it. People start shit all the time. I was like, yeah, fuck, I'll do it. it. And it was like the hardest part for me was like getting the stuff set up. I was like, yeah. I don't know how, you know, is this before your serious show? Yeah. That was even like pre radio, I think. And then kind of like the stars align and radio started. And then right after that, like the podcast discussion started, I was doing this little podcast at the time, this company called the action network, mm. where it was like a game. It was straight like golf game. I know it wasn't it. even, you know, it? Yeah. yeah. And it was like, we had one dude who was like a data analyst, like couldn't, if Rory walked in the room, might not know him, but he could tell you exactly what he thinks his price should be at a given tournament, things like that. And then we had like the moderator and then like me, I was like the subjective guy. I was like, no dude, he doesn't drive it straight enough there or whatever, all that stuff. And we go like head to head. And it was just like a little one day a week, like funsy. And then when that thing started, I was just doing it for fun or whatever. And then kind of the other stuff started. Gotcha. And so I want to get back into your golf career, but I want to stay on this topic. So when you retired from golf yeah. was like, media like a trip was a naturally transition or were you like what the hell is my next step it was absolutely not like immediate it was like what the hell am i gonna do now i'd had a like i got out of it my last year i was on the corn ferry it was now the corn ferry tour yeah. web.com at the time and like i'd i had my card i got some starts early on didn't play worth a shit so once the reshuffle happened i got shuffled out and then i was having to monday qualify and then i'd monday in and play bad and then the later in the year it got the anytime i got a start is like dude i need to press it i need to i need a top 10 i need to make some money jump back up have a chance and like the longer and longer you go on that like the more pressure you put on yourself anytime you get a start and by the end of it having to you know going from missing cuts or making cut and finishing 45th and then going back and having to pack up and race to a monday qualifier the next monday and stuff like that i was just like dude i'm tapped i honestly think like that having that like status turning into conditional status having to go through the whole monday circuit for an entire year is like maybe the quickest way to burn yourself out on golf not you a you burn through tons of cash that you've worked to you know that you've had to play mini tours or corn ferry tour or whatever to make that money and then all of a sudden you you get your opportunities and you're just dumping cash every single week and all of a sudden you burn through you know years of hard work and you got nothing to show for and at the end of that i was like you know what dude and i just turned 30 so i set a stop for myself when i started playing golf I was like if i don't have a if i don't have my card by 30 like i'm out that's plenty of time you should do it and it just so happened that year i turned 30 so i kind of knew I'd say about t halfway through the year, I was like, I'm, unless I catch fire and win or something, like I ain't going back to Q school. I'm not going to go Monday more and stuff like that. And that same year was the year, like Spieth, it was the next year actually, but he was kind of coming up, was trying to, he almost won the Grand Slam mm -hmm. at like 21 or whatever right. he was. And I was like, all right, dude, if there's 21 year olds like trying to win Grand Slams and I'm trying to Monday in and Boise, like is th this ship has sailed. And I was just, I was cool with it. And I saw so many guys that, you can always justify going, right? Because you're close. You're a week away from like potentially changing your life. But tons of guys can say that. And I saw more and more guys when I'd show up when I was 23. I'd see a 35 year old out there. I'm like, what is this? Like, come on, bud. Mm -hmm. 35, you ain't done it. Like you ain't doing it. You know what I mean? And I never wanted to be one of those guys. So I just said, like, 
clean stop. I'm out. And then after I got done, I was like, well, what now? I know I didn't golf, but I don't know what it was. I actually got into the um, financial game for a while. Wow. So yeah, I went to work for Merrill Lynch. I had this guy that like brought me on. He was like a big team and all that. Did the series seven. I mean, dude, it was such a culture shock. I, I remember I go from like playing golf with like some of the best players in the world every day, getting ready for tournaments and stuff to, the, to fast forward a few weeks. And I'm in a suit and tie, which I don't even know how to tie my own tie. Right. Like I show up, I go into a cubicle and they plop a series seven book down in front of me. That's this big. And they're like, all right, dude, you got three months past that. And then you got to go do the 66 and like, see ya. Tell right. us when you're done. And I was like looking around. I was like, what am I doing here? I got into it. I passed the test. This is 766. That's like three or four months of just right. testing. Then you're out there like, okay, now we go. I just found like very quickly that I hate talking to people about their money. I never did it growing up. I was always taught, don't talk to people about their money. And then all of a sudden it was your job. And I'm like, by the way, dude, like every guy that I know has got money. Like these guys I play golf with, they know me as sleaze. I got like a chew in and Tupac socks on. I'm like, not necessarily the vibe you want for the guy <laughs> handling your money. You know what I mean? It's right. like, yeah, you gotta be my money guy sleaze. Like, come on. Like anything in the world would be better than that. And I quickly ended it. I was like, I picked the wrong thing. I was, and so I got out and kind of messed around with some other stuff before all like the media stuff started happening. Right. I was going to say, you seem like a guy that just does not have nine to five in his DNA. Oh, dude. I was like every morning when I was going in to just literally read a book yeah. and get ready to take, which I hadn't studied since college, by the way. Like I forgot. I'm how. sure you did a lot of studying. I TCU, forgot how right? to. Dude, I was a crack student <laughs> back there. Uh, I was like, I forgot how to study. But all of a sudden that's your job. But I would wake up in the morning. It's 113 degrees in Phoenix. I'm putting on a sport coat and a tie. I'm like looking at myself in the mirror. I'm like, what in the world is my life right now? Right. Like this is golf. I knew I was done with it, but it ain't this. You know what I mean? That that's be, when all the media stuff started. That can off. be a super hard transition for a lot of athletes, oh. whether whether they're retiring from the NHL, from the PGA Tour. That next step of like, what the hell do I do with my life is really hard. Even guys that have like huge careers, make a bunch of money and they don't have to work anymore. They're right. like when they lose the thing that they've literally devoted their whole life to. Like you wake up every day and for me, it was like, what do I do today to get better at golf? Whether it was the gym, practicing, tournaments, playing, whatever, it was all catered. Or it was all catered to getting better at golf. And like going on vacation, I'd bring my, I, dude, I never went more than a week without playing golf in my since I'm 11 years old. You know what I mean? And now all of a sudden, it's like that doesn't matter anymore. That's gone. It, it becomes like your identity, and right. especially in golf, I think we're like there's a number right next to your name at the end of every day, and it says exactly how good or exactly how shitty you are. Like you. You know what I mean? It's not the sa necessarily the same in like other sports. You're individual. Like it's right. you. There's no, oh, my teammates suck or our defense is terrible or whatever like that. It's like there's no hiding behind it. Like that's exactly how good or bad you were. And dude, when all of a sudden like everything you've done your whole life and like put all your time into it, it's like that doesn't even matter anymore. It's a weird feeling. You can get lost in like pretty quick. Just you lose like, all right, what am I now? Everyone knows like, oh, Sleaze or Drew, like he's the golfer. He plays golf. He plays golf. That's what they say. You know, he's a pro golfer or whatever. Then all of a sudden they're like, Sleaze, like, Oh, I don't know what he does now. You know what I mean? Like you go mm -hmm. from this close to being at the top to just like the bottom, like square one. You're a kid fresh out of college and you don't know what you're going to do basically, except you're 29 or 30. Right. That's an interesting concept. Like being such an individual, individualistic, individual sport, yes. right? Yeah. When you have teammates and whatnot and basketball, football, whatever, but you probably made friends on the you know, corn ferry tour and whatnot, but like you're alone. That's a lonely journey. Yeah, dude. I mean, you got boys that when you're out there traveling, you got guys that you'll, when you're on the corn ferry tour and you're trying to pinch money, like, yeah. You know, you stay in rooms with guys, you travel with guys, you share cars with guys like the camaraderie. That's like our locker room. You know what I mean? When guys, a lot of guys were tired, like I missed the locker room. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same for me. It's like, dude, that was like, that was like, you're out there with the fellas. Like you're having a good time. Someone plays great. You go celebrate and you go do it the next week. Like that's your time. That's our locker room, you know, more or less. But like you said, there's no, when you're playing bad, there's nowhere to pass the buck. There's mm -hmm. no like my coach sucks, dude, you know, or our defense can't stop anybody or like our quarterback's trash. I can't get the ball. It's like, no, dude, like there ain't nobody else. It's you. And it's Drew Stoltz, 73, you suck. Yeah. Or it's Drew Stoltz, 67, oh, you're awesome. And it's so easy to get tied up and like your score becomes like your self-worth. And you see, dude, you see it on the PJ Tour all the time. I got friends that are in it right now. And it's really hard to separate like the golfer from the person. And it can just suck you. The, the longer you go not playing well, the harder it is to get out of it. Right. A hundred percent. And so now transitioning into your media career, right? You touched on it. So you were hustling there, putting some episodes together for yeah. a while. And then how did your serious opportunity come about? Did they kind of see you through those episodes that you started on your own? No. So I was, I didn't even know we were going live at that point, but yeah, I was putting these like episodes together. Some of them I thought were really cool. I sent them out to some buddies that I thought was like, would be a good gauge of like how good or bad it is. I'm like, dude, these are fascinating. These are yeah. different. You should package these up and do it. So I started doing that. But at the time, if you want to rewind just a little bit, right when I got out of golf, I'm talking like the last day when I said I quit, a good friend of mine who I still do radio with right now, Gary McCord, who was a broadcaster at the time, 
was like, let's go to lunch tomorrow. It was like the next day after I got home. And he's like, uh, here's what I want to do, dude. I want to get, uh, I'm going to contact Sirius. I want to do a radio show with you. I want to get you started, get in the game. All that. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. Like, that's exactly what I want to do. Awesome. So we got it all set up. He's like, dude, we're good to go. It starts on X date. We got three weeks to come up with like a concept, what we want to do. Boom. So I was meeting with him, talking about what we want to do, all that stuff. We had a date and at like the 11th hour, it got, the plug got pulled. And I think it was wow. just who was, em, who was employed with at the time kind of controlled his media rights. And uh, they were basically like, hey, no, you work for us. We don't want you doing other stuff. So he's like, I'm terribly sorry, but like this thing isn't going to be a go. Give me a few years. Let's see how long I want to keep working, but just put this on the back burner. So I went from like as happy as I could be like, yes, this is what I want to do to like, okay, now back at square one. That's when I got into the financial deal. So I kind of made a few relationships at Sirius at the time and then come full circle after finance. I did a little bit of real estate stuff for a while. The guy, my boy Colt knows who I know I do the podcast and radio with. He was kind of at the tail end of golf. You could tell he was battling some injuries, wasn't playing well, going through all the stuff that all the golfers go through. And he was kind of looking at like, what's next, right? So he had had a meeting set up with Sirius XM. They had agreed to give him like a one hour show each mm. week. And uh, so he calls me, he's like, hey dude, um, get ready. We're gonna start doing a show. He asked me like, do you wanna do it with me? I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I kind of knew those guys already at Sirius a little bit, yep. but it had been a few years since we had those conversations. So that started, we get one hour a week, We'll see how it goes. It's basically like a trial at that point. One hour a week ain't a job, you know what I mean? Right. And so um, we started Masters Week, like, what was it, like four years ago maybe now? And I was like, well, one hour a week, dude, you can just empty the chamber. Like, call everybody you know, get the biggest guests all the time. Let's make this thing great. So we started our first episodes with Jordan Spieth. Then it was like Justin. Then it was like Rom. And, like, all these guys we know, but we only got one guest a week. Like, like I said, you know what I mean? You can, you can, you got some runway there. And after, call it like a month or two, we kept having like guys on. It was fun. The interviews were cool. So it was like, all right, this, we like this. Let's go to three days a week, two hours. So then it becomes like a real thing. We jumped to that pretty quickly. Well, while that was kind of transitioning, um, some relationships of mine at golf.com had reached out. They was doing that podcast for Action Network, which whatever. Yeah. But they're like, hey, we want to get into the digital space. We, know, we see what you're doing with radio. I know you're doing some podcasting before. We want to start getting in the podcast game. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Here's what I want to do. I want to do long form interviews with golfers or athletes, anyone. But like, I know a lot of these guys, but they just don't have like a, they don't have a platform to come on and like actually talk how they talk and be how they are. You know what I mean? Like I'd see one of my friends in a post round interview on golf channel. He would just say the same generic shit that yep. everybody else says. I'm like, that guy's awesome. But like, if I had just seen that guy for the first time, like I wouldn't know it. To give these guys a place like put their hair down talk how they talk with their boys around the table and see it and so they're like perfect let's do that and so that's when i called colt i was like hey dude we're already doing the radio why don't you come on and do this podcast with me on golf.com it's going to start relatively soon all this stuff here's what we're going to do he's like perfect let's do that so those kind of got bottled up into the same like i guess brand if you want to call that's you know me and right. colt right and uh that started going and then that same type of deal that's one day a week it's like more or less an hour interview longer form and like our first guest was John Rom, and then John Rom like rapped on. He did, I think he rapped like we got him to rap Kendrick Lamar, who he loves, right? Yeah. Like people are like, whoa, that's kind of cool. But there's not that many listeners, but it just kept right. building traction, building traction. And then all of a sudden, like it's been cool to see where it goes. Now we get guys like reaching out, guys, and maybe we know most of them, but like maybe like an agent reaches. I was like, hey, I'd love to get this guy on the show or whatever. Sometimes or some, you'll see a guy to turn like, yo, when are you gonna have me on? Things like that. Like that's the biggest kind of compliment I think you can get when guys like actually want to come on. And so both of those things happen in relatively at the same time and it's just been it's been a ride ever since yeah it's incredible dude it's super impressive what you and Cole have built I'm a big fan Thanks, of subpar man. podcasts I think the one thing that separates you guys from a lot of the traditional media outlets is like what you said it's like getting John Rom to rap or something like undoing their hair a little bit and showing who they are like what makes them a human being and that I think is what's missing from a lot of sports yeah and so that's what we're trying to do at Torch Pro is help athletes tell their stories and do all the storytelling content. So I commend you for, for opening up players like that on your podcast. Well, thank I appreciate it. I respect the hustle that you guys are going through. I think that's what people want to see the real dude. Yeah. You get the press conferences, you get the post game interviews. It's nothing, but like yeah. the advantage we have with the golfers, like we know them. We, we played with them. We grew up with them. We went to college with them, whatever it is. So like we know stories and we know things and we know what the guy was doing before he was the big name right. guy and all that type of stuff. And we're like also just a friendly spot. Like we're not going to, we're not trying to do any gotcha stuff or anything like that. We have an occasional like serious interviews, you know what yeah. I mean? Like we had Greg Norman on when he first was launching live and we got kind of dragged for it. Cause we weren't asking all the questions, which by the way, he'd been asked 500 times and already been answered. I could right. like, read you his transcript of what he's going to say if we ask those questions, but it was more or less like, tell us about this tour. How's it going to work? How, who's on it? How's it going to operate? All that. 
we, that was like a serious, more serious one, right? But we, mostly we want to ask the questions that I think most golf fans or sports fans would want to have answered, but also like give us some shit we don't know. Give us some stories from their boys or like, yo, tell us about the one time, you know, on the mini tours or whatever. Like those are the things that I think make these guys human. Exactly. As opposed to like the guy just watching the guys you see on TV. Exactly. I, I was really I enjoyed your last uh, interview with Hoagie uh, about like, all his, a his gambling example. stories. Not a lot of people know Tom Hoagie, right? Yeah. He's a really good golfer. Might be on our Presidents Cup team, but he's not a huge name. He's not right. a brand like a Ricky or Jordan. And like people hear about these gambling stories and they're like, "Oh, dude, he's an actual regular dude." You know what I mean? And like I was just talking to him the other day at the U.S. Open and and he was like, "Dude, I'm getting a lot of comments about me loving the crap." I saw an article written <laughs> yeah. like, "This golfer secretly is addicted to gambling" or something. <laughs> I was like, "We weren't trying to make you look like a gambling addict, but people, I got more messages from him like, didn't know anything about Tom Hoagie. I'm rooting for that guy going for it. Like that's the goal, more or less." Yeah, you see the guy on the on the leaderboard. You have no idea who he is, but you listen to a podcast. He opens up a little bit. You become a fan, and and that's the power of content and the foundation of storytelling. Yeah, so, and like the big name brand guys, like. Quite honest, like I'm, we're friends with them, but like you're not gonna get a ton of crazy stuff from Justin Thomas or Ricky Fowler right. or Jordan Spieth. You might get some little stories, like things are here or there, but like they're a massive brand. They're not gonna jeopardize AT and T to tell like a crazy story from college. But when you get these retired guys, you get like we've had some former hockey players, former, the guys that are retired and done, and say like I'm good, my life's set. There ain't no can, you know, there's no canceling me. You can't do it. The guys that tell all the crazy stuff, those are the ones that are like they can just go full bore and tell all the story. Those are really fun but i totally get why like you know some guys got to still be a little bit buttoned up just because you know 100 money you know 100 percent. do you have one favorite interview that you've done so the one that like most people like which is funny because we're like a golf podcast but we have had mike commodore who is a former nhl like enforcer a guy that just came in and cracked skulls a canadian he's a 10 out of 10 human also like a diehard golfer he dude our interview with him was just basically like we just sat there and like he performed like his stories are hilarious not a ton of our fan base, I don't think, like, knew about him or whatever. Yeah. But at the end of that, they're like, oh, my God, bring that guy back. He needs – so we'll get him back. There's more stories. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But he just went on, like, you know, an abs- like just a performance. It was We were, like, crying, laughing. Uh, I don't even know all the shit we talked about. It just went so far off the rails. He right. was awesome. Mark Grace just came on, who I would argue probably most of our listeners don't have a, a huge don't understanding know. of who Mark Grace is, yeah. right? 10 telling all his old baseball stories and things like that the one that was like i thought really cool at the time um was johnny manzel so johnny moved out to scottsdale we got to know him i started playing some golf with him things like that but he had been kind of like removed from the media i mean that guy took the wrath you know what i mean for a while like a bust waste of talent all that stuff and uh he hadn't spoken to the media in a long time so we got to playing golf i was like yo dude you should come on the podcast sometime would you come on like talk about it? he's like yeah absolutely like no questions asked so it's like awesome we set it up I'm talking to him before, like, hey, anything off, you know, off the record, anything out of bounds, anything you don't want to talk about, or do want to talk about, it. like, dude, you can literally ask me anything. So he hadn't spoken to anyone really in the media for a long time. And he comes in and, dude, he was so, like, open and s- there was no passing the buck, no, like, it was this, this coach screwed me or whatever. He's like, I made so many mistakes. I squandered this. It's all on me. I fucked up. I was a kid that went from small town Texas to all of a sudden, like, drake's rapping of you know shout me out in his songs like i was invincible and he owned everything but just going through his life from like high school to like all right the, his coming out party was when they beat when a m beat alabama yep. in tuscaloosa right yep. and i remember telling me like bring me back to that monday at school after tuscaloosa and he's like dude i mean he starts telling you about it. he's like i had to go get i had to get shuttled from class to class with security because it became like a mob scene and the autographs and it all of a sudden it got to the point where they a and M told me you need to stop coming to class in person, like do it online, and all this. Like, he was like a, a, the Beatles at A and M, and like the stuff that he had available to him. Like if you're gonna tell me there's any twenty year old kid in the world no that's one gonna handle that well. fucking handle that well and not mess up, then that's the person saying that ain't never been in that situation. I guarantee it, because not many people ever have been what through what Johnny went through in terms of like immediate immediate fame, and he was so open about all of it, and it was a really cool interview, and they got picked up by a bunch of like sec football blogs and things like that and then that so really went but um he i thought his was awesome at the time yeah i'm sure you talked to a bunch of cool people but johnny he's special and yeah you put me in his shoes after oh, heisman game after beating bama like i'd be a shit 20 show. year old like drake's like hey you want to come out to my yeah. concert and go out after like, you think you're gonna maybe make some bad decisions yeah yeah maybe it's I ridiculous mean, shit. you got too much we shit. made horrible decisions we had no money or fame you like, know what i mean exactly exactly so rewinding when you first started subpar what was your biggest challenge for you guys was it like consistency because we started this podcast this is only season two yeah. now we're still learning but like what was your biggest 
biggest challenge early on? Uh, I think just like gaining momentum. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I said, our first episode ever, we had like, world, I don't know if he was world number one at the time, but call it top three in the world. Right. That's a big interview for inner golf world, right? You got John Rahm, that's one. There's only a couple higher at the time, and then he became world number one pretty quickly. It's like you could give the best interview in the world, the greatest stuff. I mean, we got Rahm, like I said, he was rapping Kendrick and all that stuff. It's like if nobody sees it, nobody knows about it, what good is it? You know what I mean? You have the best restaurant in the world with the best chef. If nobody's walking through the door, he ain't the best restaurant. Right. You know what I mean? So it's like just getting traction and I think getting the snowball going. Like you got to be consistent. It's got to be released at the same time every single week. People got to know when they can count on it and things like that. That's not really necessarily I don't find that big of a challenge for us. We like to do ours in person like you do. It's just right. better when you're face to face, 100%. right? We'll, we'll do the Zooms though when we have to. We get it. Like the schedules aren't going to line up for everyone and things like that. But it's like I think getting it off the ground, when you look at how many podcasts are on the world, I think there's like millions of them, literally millions. It's like, all right, how do we be different? What, what's why is our golf podcast better than a different podcast or, or what, you know what I mean? What, what's going to make people want to click ours versus other ones. And just, I think the call it the first couple innings of a podcast, you know what I mean? You could be putting out great stuff every single week on time. It's awesome. Maybe it's different and unique, but like, how do you get people to listen to it? And so, that's the hardest part is just getting off the ground. And then once you get it, it's like people hear it like, oh, you got to go listen to this podcast with so-and-so. And then they listen and then they tell their friends. Right. And then all of a sudden, like, wow, these numbers are really jumping up every single week. And it starts to kind of snowball from there. Yeah. And, and you can't get disgruntled by the numbers early on. So when you post your ROM interview, right, you're probably like, oh, shit. Like, I thought I this would like, do a little better. But, like, you can't get you can't get down about I remember, that. Like, I can remember, like, all our benchmarks. It's like, oh, dude, we got 5,000 listens this week. I was yeah. like, oh, shit, 5,000. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, now it's 10. Now it's 25, 50, 100, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. all the benchmarks like mean different stuff. And it's like, it's hard to get to each one of them. So like, I just, I honestly think getting, going from like zero to maybe call it 10,000. Cause I think if you get over like 10,000, you're in the top 1%. There's right. so many podcasts, but then the big dogs like Rogan are getting million. Like you, that's a different stratosphere, but like going from like zero to 10, once you get to 10, it's like, all right, there's a little bit of an audience there because, but then now the, all those people tell their friends and then all of a sudden you get to 20 quicker and to 40 quicker and just 80 quicker and all that. Yeah, 100%. You talked about the competition there in your last answer. And so with all these golf podcasts coming up, sports podcasts, whatever yeah. it may be, foreplay, GM golf, all that stuff, how do you guys see that competition? Do you guys have a good relationship with all those guys? Is it like, fuck them? Like, what's, what's your take <laughs> on them? Uh, so I've gotten to know, like, for foreplay, I've gotten – Riggs moved to Scottsdale, right? Okay. So Riggs is in town. We've gotten to know Riggs really well. He's a friend. We play golf. We hang out. I actually don't even know if I've played with Riggs, but we've hung out a lot, mm. you know, that type of stuff. Riggs has been great. Nothing but good things to say about four. I like what they do. You know what I mean? They, they're, they're trying to make golf more less like elitist, I guess. You know what I mean? Yep. Like it's for everyone. You have a casual fan or a diehard golfer, like listen or whatever. And, and then they probably represent like the, the casual dude a little bit more. I think what separates us is that like we've both done it like Colt played on tour you know what I mean yeah. like I didn't get my tour card but I could play some golf you know what I mean and I've played with all these guys so it's less I think ours I don't mean this in like a negative way to anybody else because there are some former players now that are, I feel like it's gaining popularity and they're kind of coming out and doing some stuff too but like we approach the interviews and the things like when they sit down with us it's not like from a quote-unquote like fan perspective and I don't mean that to be like an it's like they're our friends yeah like yo you stayed at my house last night you know what I mean like yep. what about the time you got shit faced and passed out and threw up in my bathroom you know what I mean it's not like hi, like oh my god so and so just said hi to me it's right. like we really know these guys and right. they're friends and I think they get that that's when they come on it's like friendly it's I hope it feels like less of an interview like we ask don't get me wrong is ask question ask question like that's what yep. everybody does but hopefully it feels more conversational just amongst like guys that play golf you right. know what i mean as opposed to like we love golf but we've never been around we have never played it at, you know you just kind of have like an under, i think you can talk about golf in a little bit different different language than maybe some of the other guys but like i think the more people that do it and they'll be more and more like it's good like competition is good for everybody you know what i mean me. and like me. and Hopefully we um, can stand up to all of it. And I, I hope that we're the place where like guys want to like, get in the Norman interview. Like I got to know Greg, I worked with Greg at the Ryder. This was gnarly. Cause like, dude, Ryder Cup wasn't that long ago. Right. You know what I mean? I was like last, what, October. Mm -hmm. And I was in the booth with him at the Ryder Cup, calling the matches with Greg Norman, like on my side, taking pictures and all that stuff. And like, that's where I got to know Greg. Cole got to know him at the Ryder Cup as well. And like, Fast forward now to like what Greg Norman's reputation is in golf. It's like he's ruining golf and all this stuff. But like, that's why we got the first interview with Greg Norman. You know what I mean? That doesn't come if we don't work with Greg and know Greg and all that type of stuff. So it's like a little bit different in that respect. And like, hey, let's call a guy, 
try to set up an interview, never met you, never talked to you before. Yeah, relationship building's huge in the yeah. world of media and creating those good relationships, and you guys have done a great job of that. And so you mentioned kind of where Subpar is going a little bit, but so do you have like a dream state of Subpar? Is it, is it beyond a podcast? What, what What's your goal there? I think my goal, I think our goal with, with Subpar is like we'll always be golf first. That's what we are, that's what we know, that's who we know, all that stuff. But I want to, I like scaling it out to other athletes too, and just touch golf. Like guys, there's almost everybody likes golf or has played golf or has something, you know, some sort of relationship with golf. I want to scale it out to like other athletes, entertainers. It doesn't necessarily have to be like exclusive golf. We still want to stay true to like who we are. And like, I think even not even getting the biggest names in golf is, is sometimes more fun when you get some of the smaller names. They could tell you about the come up or mini tour stories and things like that because you know, how much of a different interview can you get with Ricky, even if you're best buddies with him, you know what I mean? Like, you can only get so much. So I think some of those are fun, exploring all avenues of golf. And then eventually, I don't know, we've kind of had some nipples here and there, but we'll see. Like, you know, Faraday did Faraday Show on Golf Channel, right? And that was kind of the unique, like, interview show. Well, he ain't doing it anymore. Like, maybe there's a maybe there's a spot there where this becomes more like a TV show. I really personally, if you're just asking Drew, like, what do you like or what do you want to do? I love David Lever David Letterman. I think he's the best interviewer in the game. Um, my next guest is on Netflix. Have you seen it? Like where he goes and like I haven't. whoever he goes like like he'll go to Chappelle yeah. and he'll go to his town in Ohio and they walk around, tell him about your town, do all this stuff, and then it leads into like a long interview where they go, dude, it'll be funny as shit one minute and then super serious and then funny again and then serious. And I just like it's like a whole kind of behind the scenes followed by like an in depth interview with the guy. I love that personally. That's kind of like the I guess ultimate you'd say. If you're asking me personally. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. we're going to get Colt on the show too. Oh, yeah. But we're kind of more or less following the same path we're doing right now. But like, if you want to make it into television, like do it like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's awesome. Kind of so, like Faraday did, I guess. Yeah. Before diving into some rapid fire, I am like a 20 handicap. You've yes. Never, you've never seen me play golf before. Mm -hmm. uh, I played college sports. So like I'm, I'm an athlete. But what without ever seeing me swing, like what, what would your one tip be for me out there? Oh, okay. One tip for a 20 handicap. I'll tell you, if you want to go from a 20 to the 15, the fastest, it's just around the greens, guaranteed. Yeah. Like, you get in a bunker, my guess is, like, sometimes you get out, sometimes you don't, sometimes you knife it, sometimes you chunk 100%. it, whatever. Like, you can tighten up, you can pick up so many shots just around the greens. Because, like, going from a 20 to a 5, like, you're going to have to get a, your swing's going to have to get better, your ball strength's going to have to get better, a lot of stuff's going to get better, and that takes time. But, like, you can get to where, like, all right, if I miss a green, my next shot goes onto the green, and then I do no more than two putt from there. So just learning how to get out of a bunker, learning how to hit like a, whatever type of shot it is. Like if it's a mini flop or whatever, like doesn't have, you don't have to hit it stiff or anything like that. Just I get this on the green and I two putt, and no more. You turn doubles and triples into bogeys instead. You can make a lot of bogeys in a round and be a twenty handy. Yep, you know what I mean. It's the triple triple double combo, you know, that makes you be a twenty. So it's just. Quickest way to tighten it up, I think, would just be around the greens putting. Period. You would have to hit it. You wouldn't have to go to the range. I think you go from twenty to fifteen quick. Got it. I mean, I'm fully addicted to the sport. I, I love it's it. It's like crack, dude. It's crazy. It's once it, once it gets you, like it's got you. It's amazing. Yeah. When did you fall in love with it? When did you? I was like, playing? I guess late by today's standard, it was like eleven or twelve. I played everything kind of growing up. Yeah. Messed around with my dad and the golf, you know, but more or less, I just wanted to go drive the golf cart and run around right. and do shit like that. So, but then, like, about 12, I don't even know what it was. It wasn't like a specific moment, but like 12, I went out and started doing some, I was like, oh my God, I loved it. And then, like, from that point, it was like, only thing I wanted to do sun up, sun down, ride my golf, ride my bike to the course, golf every day, wait till it's dark, drive home, go home, eat dinner, chip and putt in my basement, do it. It was like live, breathe, eat golf. But I had to put golf down in the winter every year because I grew up uh, in Colorado, so I like played basketball throughout but well, you had to it was snowing you couldn't go play golf we didn't have the indoor right. stuff and all that they have now so that's also good but when the weather got good again like i was ready to go you don't get burnt out you can easily get burnt out as a kid if you're in a 365 day if like you grow up in arizona you okay, know what so i mean you play golf good, every day it's probably good it's that you have easy to get burnt yeah. yeah exactly awesome yeah so some rapid fire here i know you kind of do this on your show yes. sometimes Let's but, go. Uh, we'll dive right in you do one word one phrase take as long as you want okay uh, but who's your favorite athlete growing up as a kid nick van axel who is your Has anyone ever said Nick before? Never, I don't Nick the Quick, is. shout out. Nick Van Axel, Nuggets point guard back when the Nuggets won like 12 games a year. Loved him. The dude that shot the free throws from like five feet behind the line. He was my dude. I respect that answer. Um, who's your favorite <laughs> athlete to watch in current day sports? Ooh, okay. Um, um, Steph, I mean, that's kind of cliche. Steph's incredible. different. Changed the whole game. Now everyone wants to pull up from 32 feet. Steph's fun. 
Um, football side. I'll just go with Steph because I just he's like he's one of one. There's more dudes trying to do it, but like he's the OG. Right. What was your favorite moment in the history of sports? Any sport? TCU Rose Bowl in Pasadena against Wisconsin. I was there. We should have won the Natty that year. We got pimped out of it. But that game, all my boys from college going to that and watching us finish the unbeaten season. I ain't the biggest moment in sports, but it was from where we got to. It was like, this is sweet. What year was that? Uh, 2000, uh, that's going to sound like shit when I don't even know the year. 2010-ish, yeah. somewhere in there, 11, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there. A few, it was a couple years after I got off. Got it. Andy Dalton, yeah, 2011, I think. Oh, Dalton was there. Yeah, yeah. that was AD. I remember that. Jerry I Hughes, I and those that. dudes. Yeah, that was a squad. Uh, where does the nickname Sleaze come from? Sleaze comes from a mini tour buddy of mine who was coming down, <clears throat> used to stay with me a little bit in Arizona, play some Jiggy Jacks back and forth, and we'd go out in between and we'd play matches. And one day we were out there playing. I was hitting it like shit. He was hitting it good. I was missing fairways, missing greens. He was hitting fairways, hitting greens. But I was getting up and down from everywhere. I, that was probably my best strength. Was the short game around the greens and um, I was getting up and down from everywhere and just tying him, tying him, tying him. And after like the sixth or seventh hole of me just getting up and down from nowhere, he's like, these are some of the sleaziest pars I've ever seen. It was nothing, it was like a nothing comment, throw away, didn't think a thing of, I'm just laughing, whatever. I'm just like, and he'd be like, well, here comes the sleaze or something along those lines. Oh, this, this, you know, here's the sleaze or something like that. And like, dude, they started calling me and just in that little group, then we got into the grill afterwards and like someone was like, how'd it go? And he's like, well, this sleeze shot 72 without hitting four greens or whatever it was. And dude, it was like, from that day forward, I never, I ne it would have never thought when he made that comment, like, oh, that'll be my name for the rest of my life. And I just, it just like caught on like fire around like Whisper Rock Scottsdale. And then from then on, it's just like, that's what everyone calls me. Right. So yeah, shout out Derek Tolan. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and so you asked this question on your podcast, dead or alive, you could trade labs with anyone. There it is. Good. There it is. Oh, I, dude, I've thought about this so many times. So I got two answers for you, bro. I'm either going to be Ricky Gervais and just rock an arena comedy style like he does. I think he's the best in the game right now. Him, Bill Burr, and Chappelle. So I just pick one of them. I think I like Ricky the best. Or I'm Jay Z. And I'm popping up from the bottom of the stage in Madison Square and the whole place is just going batshit. Just from, I just think like destroying an entire arena where people are like crying to see you it's yeah. got to be just like the like the, the pinnacle of everything you know what i mean like they just live and die and i don't have like yeah so hope at madison square yeah. might be it and i'll just play for 90 minutes and everyone will know every word it'd be sick that'd be fucking awesome. yeah favorite drink post round Tran a good round transfusion i think i drink 99 percent transfusion on and off the golf course so that's vodka ginger ale splash of grape i feel like they've really Caught like there's I go to a club like trying to get transfusion I'm like yeah I don't know what that is now it's like yeah. everywhere but I'm pretty much strictly that if I'm stepping foot on a golf course it's exclusively that more or less mm -hmm. last one here what is one word that best describes you besides sleep <laughs> okay that's gonna be super <laughs> um I'd say irreverent maybe like I would that'd be a word like I don't take shit too seriously hopefully you know I don't want to be too grab assy on all the shows and things like that, but I don't take myself seriously. I think all this stuff, at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is have fun. All we're trying to do is be entertaining. People want to listen to us, have a good time. I just want everyone to walk away like a smile, enjoying it. And I like, if you want to get into some serious topics, more than happy to. I actually enjoy doing that sometimes, but I just want like, I just think, dude, with everything that's going on, it's like, this shit ain't that serious. Nobody's stuff really is. We get caught up in so much like little stuff day in, day out. It's like, just try, I just want everyone to like have a good time. Everywhere I go, I just want people to have fun and like smile and do all that. So I just, I try not to take stuff too seriously. I hope it translates to my work to an extent without getting like too, like I said, you know, kind of loosey goosey, but more or less, I just think at the end of the day, when you're all said and done, you're retired, you're dead, whatever, you're not gonna be like, damn, I wish I was just a little more uptight, you know, in my whole life. It's yeah. like, people just get so wound and I'm guilty of it too, but I try not to. Yeah, and my last question was gonna be, what's one lesson that you've learned throughout your journey that you could pass on to the next generation? But I'm gonna take that answer and not let you get too serious and we'll end there, but Drew, I appreciate it. Yeah, today. dude, appreciate you. Yeah. Good luck with everything you're doing. I love the hustle, I love what you guys are doing. If there's any way I can help with it, I man. appreciate that, man. Everyone go check out Subpar, and we'll do this soon. My man. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel if you enjoyed the content. There's plenty more Pass the Torch episodes along with other podcasts we got going on and video series we do. So subscribe and we'll see you later.